Hey, welcome to Board Game Casual and the 1,000 Subscriber Spectacular. Thank you again to everyone who's been subscribing to the channel. It means so much to me. In this video, I thought it would be fun to rank every game that I've played so far in 2024. I've played a total of 24 different games up until this point. This includes some new games I've played for the first time, many from the shelf of shame of unopened games, as well as some classic favorites to give you an idea of how they stack up against each other. Now, some of these games I've talked about in previous videos, so I'll do my best to point those videos out and keep it short. Here we go! I've been pretty fortunate that all the games I've played this year have been pretty good, but something's gotta start this list off, even though that doesn't necessarily make it a bad game. So coming in at number 24 is Wits and Wagers, it's Vegas, baby. This is a light, welcoming party game where you draw a question, everyone secretly writes their best guess, Price is Right style, i.e. closest without going over. The guesses are then revealed and everyone bets on which guess they think is actually closest. I got this on a bit of a whim when I saw it on sale for $6.99. And while it's a decent party game and mechanically pretty fun, unfortunately the component quality of this version feels every bit of a $6 production. I got a full in-depth review comparing it to another game I got a great deal on, Big Boss, which you'll see a little higher up on this list, so be sure to check that video out to hear more of my thoughts on Wits and Wagers, it's Vegas, baby. Number 23 is Magnetism, a fun, simple dexterity game where you take turns with your opponents placing marbles onto this kind of springy, dimpled board. The goal is to be the first to place all your marbles on the board. However, this is easier than it sounds because the marbles are actually magnetic and placing them in the wrong spot or without enough care can cause them to snap together and now you have to take all those marbles back. Like Jenga, this game has a lot of fun tension because those marbles could snap at any moment, literally causing people to scream or jump. And there's a lot of gamesmanship in trying to set up traps for your opponents. It's great to have out at a party because it's light and easy to play, it can play up to four people, and it's also a spectacle for the viewing audience as well. There are different productions of this game out there. I was first introduced to it at a friend's house and she has a version with a bigger board and maybe 50% more marbles for each player. My girlfriend surprised me with this version as a gift, which comes with a total of 20 marbles. Unfortunately, this smaller sized version basically means sudden death. It's almost impossible to make a comeback after some of your marbles snap together because usually it means your opponent only has a few marbles left to play. Compared to the bigger version I played with 30 marbles where even if you snap a few together, you've still got time to mount a comeback. Now for a party situation, this might actually be a good thing. It keeps games quick, but I personally prefer a little more back and forth. So I'm putting this specific version of magnetism at number 23. The Genius Square is a little polyomino puzzle game where players are racing to be the first to place their Tetris style pieces into their board around the blocked squares that are rolled randomly before each game. My friend Andy brought this as a gift as a fun pre-game to determine player order in whatever bigger game we plan to play. It comes with two boards, but if you want to play with more people, you can just buy as many copies as you want and everyone can still play simultaneously. Even though I'm not a big fan of polyomino games, or puzzles for that matter, this one plays so fast I thought it was pretty fun. The chunky wooden pieces are very satisfying to snap into their plastic player board, and honestly, I'm just blown away by the math in this game where no matter what starting positions are rolled for the blockers, players will always be able to place all of their pieces. You can see more about the Genius Square in the Ranking 8 Games from an Epic Weekend of Gaming video. Point City is a follow-up to the popular game Point Salad. I had heard Point City takes Point Salad and adds a little more complexity and depth to the game with some elements very similar to the game Splendor, so I was really excited to give this one a try when my buddy brought it over. Unfortunately, I don't think Point City is as good as either of those two games. In fact, you'll see both Point Salad and Splendor later on higher in this list. Mechanically, I like a lot of things that are going on in this game. But to me, the game is really clunky. On your turn, you take two cards at the same time. Either one can be of either type of card, uh, resources or building cards. 
And then those empty slots now get replaced by the opposite type of card that you took. But before you replace the cards, you're likely to take some actions first based on those cards that you took. So they give you these tokens as placeholders to remind you what type of card should go in that spot. Assuming you can remember whether the token represents the type of card you took or the type of card that it should be replaced with. So taking the cards and placing the tokens in their spot only to then replace those tokens with new cards, it just feels really cumbersome. On top of that, there's this rule that the two cards you have to take have to be adjacent to each other, which is just another clunky thing that slows the game down. I almost wonder if this game's relation to Point Salad hurts it here. Point Salad is so quick and snappy that I was expecting Point City to have a great pace as well, but it's nowhere near as elegant. I wonder if this game had a totally different look and a name with no connection to Point Salad if I'd like it better since I'd be coming in without any bias. But I mean, it's also a lot clunkier than Splendor 2. Overall, the game is a fun little engine builder and has mechanisms I enjoy. My girlfriend liked it a lot. I would gladly play Point City if someone else wanted to, but it's not a game that I personally would bring to the table and not one that I plan to go out and buy. Love Letter is a classic game I've always heard about and I finally played for the first time. I picked up a copy on sale last year and it was the honorable mention on my top 10 games I'm most excited to play in 2024 list. It's a mechanically simple game. On your turn, you draw a card from the deck and you can play that card or the card that's already in your hand and follow that card's effects. The goal is to have the highest value card in your hand when the deck runs out or to eliminate all other players. It's fun, especially playing with five or six people, but candidly, it felt a little dated playing for the first time here in 2024. I didn't feel like I had a ton of agency holding two cards in my hand and having to play one of them. In a lot of cases, it didn't feel like I had much of a choice of which one to play. Trying to suss out which of my opponents had which card was fun, but playing those accusation type cards often felt like a shot in the dark. I hear Love Letter is all about the metagame as you become more familiar with it. In fact, Love Letter is my friend Alex's favorite board game of all time. So I'm definitely eager to see if I like it more with more plays. Adventureland was another game I had unopened on my shelf for a while that I was determined to play this year. It was number 9 on my top 10 games I'm most excited to play in 2024 list, and falls into the number 19 spot on this list of games I've played so far in 2024. Adventureland is consistently in Tom Vassell's top 100 games of all time, and so when I saw it on sale for something like 15 bucks, I pulled the trigger. I was really glad to finally get this one to the table. Adventureland is a worker placement, worker movement game of exploration, discovery, and combating monsters, trying to finish with the most points at the end of the game. The game board is mapped out by a two-dimensional grid. All players have a bunch of meeples that start up at the top left of the board. On your turn, you may move any one of your meeples as far as you want to the right, picking up any bonus or tokens on the space you land in, and then as far as you want downward, again, picking up any bonuses. You can do this in either order, vertical or horizontal, but you can never go backwards. The other hook is that the tokens get placed on the board slowly as the game goes along. You reveal cards from the terrain deck in each turn. The cards basically tell you where to place what type of bonus token, so if you've moved too far, it's likely that a token may be revealed behind you that you can no longer get with this meeple. The tokens might be things like gold or weaponry that help you defeat monsters or helpful herbs, or they might be a monster that you have to fight, which will require some strategic planning of how much of your equipment to use to help mitigate dice that you'll be rolling to defeat the monster. Adventureland was pretty fun overall, but felt a little dated. The artwork and graphic design, for example, was fine, but felt a little dull. The rule book definitely wasn't the best. Some parts were pretty confusing. I think probably because this was translated into English from the original German, I think. And this led to a lot of debate trying to agree on what the rules were actually trying to say. The game also comes with some different adventures or variants on setup and play, so I'm interested to try those out. 
but to be totally candid, it might be tough to want to pull this game out over other games on the shelf, so we'll see how quickly this one gets played again. Earlier I talked about Point City, and here at number 18 is its predecessor, Point Salad. This is such an awesome little card game to have on your shelf. Point Salad is a good game when you have family over or non-board gamers. Anyone who's ever played a card game can play this game. You can teach it in about 60 seconds. It's a great little filler game in between bigger games or when you don't have a lot of time since it can be played in about 20 minutes. It's remarkable that this game is so light but still gives you some meaty decisions. You can hear more of my thoughts on Point Salad in the 8 board games from an epic weekend of gaming video. Number 17 on the list, Glow, is a tale of two halves. I really liked one half of the game with the card and dice drafting, the engine building, and the mitigation management, but the other half of the game, moving on the game board with its questionable scoring system and annoyingly tiniest wooden components I've ever seen, leaves a lot to be desired. I've got a full in-depth review of Glow on the channel where I go into much more detail. It's a shame because I really do like that first half of this game, especially the dice return system. It's so fun. Moon River was another new game I was introduced to this year by a friend, what up Andrew, which builds on the widely popular classic game, King Domino. And this is another game where I have a dedicated in-depth review video if you're interested in seeing more. I really like the twist in this game where you're drafting halves of the domino and then forming your own domino tiles to play. I like King Domino a lot, but I actually think I prefer Moon River to King Domino. Though, this game does have a bit of take that, and I wonder if this will wear on me as time goes by. I also still think the name Moon River is a weird choice. Hey, don't turn your nose up at hook and ring battle just because it doesn't look like your typical board game. This is without a doubt my favorite dexterity game, and I've put it at number 15 on this list. It's amazing how something so simple can be so fun and so challenging. It's a great game to have at parties and the perfect way to engage with someone, especially if you're playing with shots or shooters. You can teach it in about 10 seconds, but anyone watching from afar will immediately intuit how to play. I like this specific production a lot because of how easy it is to adjust the tension in the ropes. Be sure to check out my full review of Hook and Ring Battle by Buffalo Games for more info. Coming in at number 14 is Earth. This was a new game I got as a gift for a friend as it was one of the most popular and well-reviewed games that came out last year in 2023. I was really excited to try it out because this game is all about everyone getting to do actions even on someone else's turn. I love games where a player's action triggers something you get to do as well. It always feels like a fun, powerful bonus and it really minimizes downtime. To be honest, Earth to me was just okay. It's a decent game, and my girlfriend really likes Earth. But I'm really surprised by how much fanfare this game gets. For whatever reason, it doesn't really grab me as this amazing game that people make it out to be, and I think it suffers from some graphic design issues. You can check out my more in-depth review of Earth in the Ranking for New Board Games video, and see how my friends and I ranked it to three other new games we played that weekend. I even did a Design Diaries episode where I used some examples from Earth as questionable graphic design, why it's problematic, and how I would suggest fixing it. So you might find that video interesting as well. Now I've had the chance to play it a few more times since, and the game certainly gets better as you become more familiar with the cards and all of the different scoring mechanics. But personally, I would still much rather play Roll for the Galaxy than Earth. Number 13 has become one of my favorite light games, big group party games when I have a good amount of non-gamers, and that's Green Team Wins. In Green Team Wins, you flip over a card with an ambiguous multiple choice or fill in the blank question on it, and everyone secretly writes their answers on a whiteboard. Everyone then reveals simultaneously, and you score based on the majority. 
It's super simple, but a lot of fun. It creates some great conversation and some fun ah moments, and it's light and breezy. Anyone can play it, and it doesn't put any one person on the spot. Previously, my go-to game for a big group with non-gamers was The Chameleon. The Chameleon is great. In my opinion, it's a social deduction game in the simplest, most distilled, approachable form. But I think I actually like Green Team Wins better for this type of situation. Of course, you can play as big as a game as you like by putting multiple copies together, but what's really clever about this game is that it has a logical scoring mechanism and a game end, something lacking in The Chameleon. Green Team Wins was another one of the eight games I talked about about in the video, eight board games from an epic weekend of gaming. I've had fun playing this with family and even as a filler game between heavier games with my gamer friends, and I highly recommend it, especially as it's been going on sale for under 10 bucks. Number 12 is another new to me game this year, Mystic Market. A buddy brought this little economic game over and I really enjoyed my play. Mystic Market has a great table presence, the centerpiece of which is this gravity-fed ramp of potion vials. During the game, as you play cards and buy potions, you'll be picking one of the vials off the ramp, moving it to the top, sending all the others toppling down, and thereby changing the value of each vial. This game is all about timing when to buy and when to sell all while keeping an eye on what cards your opponents are grabbing and trying to predict any price movements they may cause. I found it a ton of fun. The production quality for such a small game is top notch and it's really satisfying when you get to move the vials, both tactically as well as setting up a good chain or knowing that you've sniped in before your opponents can. I've only played the game once, but I find myself thinking about it a lot, and I really want to play it again. I could see the possibility of this game feeling a little samey after several plays, and I'm still a bit mixed on the potion cards and how beneficial they are. The game moves at a really fast clip and is pretty neck and neck, and therefore buying the potion cards seems like it may slow you down more than they help, but I really need more plays to be sure. Knowing that my buddy's got a copy, I'm not rushing out to get my own, but I do look forward to getting in another game. And in fact, I bought this game for another friend who has a daughter thinking that might be a good game for them to play together. Number 11 really surprised me with how much I liked it. It might be the biggest surprise on this list, and it reminded me of just how much I love deck building games. That's The Hunger. I had never heard of this game until my buddy brought it over, and to be totally honest, I wasn't sold on the cover. But man, this game is fun. In The Hunger, you're playing as vampires, leaving the castle at night to feed on the townsfolk, but then racing to get back before the sun rises. This game, in a lot of ways, is similar to Clank in that it's a deck builder and you're running out on the map to get the most points, but need to make it back in time because if you don't, you automatically lose. I actually much prefer The Hunger to Clank. In The Hunger, getting stuck behind another player is much less of an issue. In Clank, if you get stuck behind someone, it usually means they'll get to all the good loot before you can. The Hunger feels like you have more ways to form a strategy than being reliant on movement. And I think this game focuses more on the deck building. Clank also gives me a ton of anxiety that I, I don't get from this game. I had so much fun with this game. You can see my full review in the Ranking 4 New Board Games video where I go into more details. I'm really looking forward to giving this one another try. Part of me does wonder if there's enough content in here to keep it from getting stale after a few plays, but for now, I really liked it. I've also been seeing this game go on sale for something like 15 bucks. So if you like deck builders or are a fan of Clank, I definitely recommend scooping it up at that price. The production is very nice. Hey, real quick, before we get into the top 10, I just wanted to let you know that I've got merch, which I think is pretty cool. You should consider getting yourself a hoodie or a t-shirt. That way, I'll know exactly who to high five when I'm out in public. Plus, every dollar goes right back into making this channel better. Okay, thanks. Number 10 is probably my favorite game for a group of four or five players for those who don't want to learn a ton of rules. QE. 
QE, which stands for quantitative easing, was my number three game of 2023, and I've already played it a bunch of times this year as well. This is a very unique game that feels like it shouldn't work, but does, and it's a ton of fun. In this game, you're playing as nations bidding on industries. Each turn, an industry token will be flipped over and players will secretly bid on that token. The catch? There are no limits to how much you can spend. You can bid as high as you want. However, at the end of the game, the player who spends the most money is automatically eliminated. And likewise, there's a bonus for being the player who spent the least. There's a set collection aspect where the industries you win can score in different ways, and therefore different industries may be more valuable to some players than others. This is such a great game to have on your shelf for when you have people over who typically don't like board games, or just when you want to play something a little out of the ordinary. Wingspan Asia is such an interesting concept as it is both an expansion to the base Wingspan game, but also a complete standalone two-player game. Now, I've never played it as an expansion, though from what I can tell, it basically just allows you to play Wingspan with more players. As a two-player standalone, however, this game shines. I like Wingspan a lot. My girlfriend loves it. And without a doubt, if we're going to play a two-player game of Wingspan, from now on, we're going to play Wingspan Asia. Like the base game, it's got everything you need in it, but the additional sideboard module is so much fun and really adds a lot more depth and strategy to the game. It allows you to mix things up more rather than deferring to the egg-laying strategy in the last few rounds. This was another one I reviewed in the eight board games from an epic weekend of gaming video if you'd like to see more. If you primarily play two-player games or you play a lot of Wingspan at two, I highly recommend checking out Wingspan Asia, my number nine. The number eight game I played so far this year is Flamecraft. This was number one on my unopened games I'm most excited to play in 2024 list, even though I famously upgraded the coins even before playing it last year. And it's yet another game I reviewed in the ranking for new board games video. I've had a chance to play Flamecraft a couple of times since then, and I've liked it more each time I played it. Some of those premium shops that come out get pretty unique and really make for a fun game. In my last play, I had this little engine going where I was going back and forth between the shop that allowed you to make straight money. Felt really powerful. The game has a nice progression because each shop gets more powerful with each visit and the more powerful shops get added to the board as the game goes along, giving you a ton of fun choices, but while moving at a good pace. Even though I wasn't a fan of the artwork at first, the Miyazaki-style art and pun-filled names really won me over. Flamecraft swung back and forth from having a ton of hype when it was first released to the hardcore gamers then turning up their noses at it saying it's overhyped to now settling into what to me is a really solid medium light worker placement game that's a really nice production and beautiful to look at. I certainly wouldn't hesitate to recommend Flamecraft to someone playing it for the first time in 2024. You can also find this game on sale for under 30 bucks if you keep your eyes open. Number seven on the list is Big Boss, which I bought on a whim when I saw it selling for $10 on Amazon. This game blew me away. It's a fun economic game where you're building and growing companies with these chunky Lego style pieces and this Funko production is amazing. It feels like a premium edition version of a game that would be a hundred dollar Kickstarter. I mean, they even included component trays for the money tokens. I've got a full in-depth video review on the channel, so please check that out if you haven't already, because Big Boss is an older game that shouldn't go overlooked by newer gamers. If you don't have the wallet or the space for Foundations of Rome, for example, Big Boss might help scratch a similar itch. I easily recommend it at twice the price, even three times, and it's very likely Big Boss will be on my top 10 games of 2024 list. Number six is one of my favorite games of all time, a true classic, Century Gollum Edition. 
I've already pulled it out multiple times this year, including in the eight board games from an epic weekend of gaming. This game just speaks to me. I love how well it flows. It plays at such a snappy pace and just sings. On your turn, you're basically choosing between four simple actions, and yet it feels like you have so much agency and strategic options in front of you. It also has my favorite type of card market, where you can take the first card for free or drop a jewel on any number of cards to take one further up the row. And as the game goes along, those jewels stack up and now cards become too good to pass up. The production quality is fantastic, big glossy cards, chunky jewels complete with their own organizer trays and hefty metal coins. Century Golem is still awesome after all these years. If somehow you haven't played it yet, I highly recommend it. Go give it a try. Number five on this list is Champions of Midgard with the Valhalla expansion. Champions of Midgard was number two on my top 10 new to me games of 2023. And this year I finally got to play it with the Valhalla expansion as well. Champions of Midgard is a fun worker placement game where you're recruiting warriors in the form of dice to go fight monsters and earn victory points. The Valhalla expansion provides an added dimension to the game, turning your fallen warriors into Valhalla tokens, which you then use towards other bonuses, additional ways to score, or even more warriors. I totally agree with all the sentiments that the Valhalla expansion is a must have for the game and I don't ever see playing without it from this point forward. You can see my in-depth review of Champions of Midgard with the Valhalla expansion in the eight board games from an epic weekend of gaming video where I go into much more detail. And you can also check out the video on the cheap metal coins I found on Amazon for it that I think are a great fit. I was pretty late to the game on Champions of Midgard, but I am loving every play. Mosaic, A Story of Civilization was my and my friend's favorite new game from the Ranking for New Board Games video, and it's one of my favorite new games overall. Right now, it's a very strong contender for being my favorite new to me game of 2024. It's a bit of a table hog, it's a bit of a setup slog, but man, once this game gets going, it's so much fun. It's pretty intuitive and it plays at such a great pace. Take an action, next player. Take an action, next player. And yet you have so much agency in what you can do. Somehow this game has found the magic balance of giving you a ton of choice, but without that resulting in a ton of analysis paralysis. For me, this game was pretty close to a 10, though there were some minor production issues, at least in this version, holding it back from a perfect score. I talk more about it in that other video, so be sure to check it out to hear why I love this game. Okay, these top three games could honestly be in any order. I love them all so much, and which one I like best really depends on which way the wind is blowing that day, so don't be surprised if these flip-flop on future lists. Lost Ruins of Arnak has quickly become one of my favorite games of all time, and I'm putting it at number three. This game is such a fun mix of deck building, worker placement, tableau building, and exploration. I really like the action management system. On your turn, you can perform one action as long as you have the workers or the resources to do so. It goes around and around until no players have any actions left to take, which ends the round. And it feels really powerful when you can get just the right combo of resources or manipulate your tableau in a way to be able to squeeze out an extra action. In some cases, I'm trying to get my two meeples out as quickly as possible to get to the good spots before my opponents can. And in other cases, I might draw it out doing other things on my turn to save that meeple for when I really need it, hoping for the right space to open up. It's a great meteor game. Lost Ruins of Arnak is a great one to try if you've been playing games like Wingspan and Everdell. I don't think that this is much more complex. It can look a bit overwhelming at first, but really makes sense once you start playing. This is the one that famously, as I was introducing it to a couple of gamer friends, my buddy David pulled out his phone and ordered himself a copy midway through the first play because he liked it so much. It's a ton of fun. I talk much more about it in the Ranking 8 Games from an Epic Weekend of Gaming video. And of course, if you're gonna get the game, spend a couple extra bucks on these metal coins I found on Amazon that are the perfect fit. 
Number two is the long reigning defending champ, Splendor. I still love Splendor to this day in a lot of the same ways I love Century Golem. It's a game that really just sparks that portion of my brain. I find the progression so satisfying, feeling more powerful and more clever with each turn, and yet it's the type of game I can play while relaxing. I can have a conversation while playing this game. Without a doubt, there are times I want to be playing a meatier, heavier, maybe more thematic game, but I've got to give extra points to Splendor with how easy and often it gets to the table. It's one of my go-tos to introduce new people to that don't play a ton of board games, and it's always a hit. The production is great. To me, these big poker chip style tokens are the gold standard. People like to complain about the box being too big, but I think the insert is fantastic. It keeps everything organized, a place for everything, and everything in its place. I love organizers that store cards on their sides. They're so much easier to grab. For many years, if you asked me what my favorite game of all time was, I wouldn't hesitate to say Splendor. And the game I'm putting at number one in the games I've played so far in 2024 list is Space Space. I love, love, love Space Space. I did a whole video on why I recommend Space Space for people who like Catan, especially if you love getting rewards not only on your turn when you're rolling the dice, but also when other people are rolling the dice on their turns. There's almost no downtime in the game. I love the agency you have in this game choosing how to manage and mitigate your power-ups, choosing when to go hard on income or when to go hard on points, and especially that choice of either taking the sum of the two dice or the individual values of each face. It gives you the opportunity to feel really powerful. I love that this game is a race rather than a fixed number of rounds. I love that this game feels different at different player counts and that you need to think about your strategy a bit depending on how many people you're playing with. I love that this game is easy to teach and it's always been a hit with everyone I introduced to it. I love that if you didn't think it was fast enough to play already, it even includes a light speed variant where you start off with more cards, getting your engine up and running even faster. If you haven't played Space Space, I highly, highly recommend checking it out. So there you have it, all the games I've played so far this year, at least those I can remember playing, and I'm looking forward to playing many, many more. Like I said, the order, especially as you get towards the top, really varies depending on how I'm feeling that day. I mean, if you were instead asking me which of these games I want to play most right now, I might say Mosaic. I'd love to hear what your favorite game is that you've played so far this year down in the comments. Thank you for watching this special video celebrating 1,000 subscribers. Thank you to each and every one of you who have taken the time to subscribe to the channel. And for those that haven't yet, please consider subscribing now. Thank you for liking this video. Thank you for liking any other videos of mine that you've watched. And I'll see you next time here on Board Game Casual.